Okay, and we're back in the room. Let's see if I'm bringing out a win. Okay, great. Adam's here. I'm going to invite him in to come onto the stage. So welcome, by the way, if you're just joining us, there's a few people who just joined the last session. You are joining our Round the Clock Trader Summer School with me, Simon. Anything you've missed is being recorded, so you don't need to, to worry. You can access the recordings, in fact, in here on this platform on the link, um, or indeed on our YouTube channel at IX Investor. There he is. Okay. Good afternoon, Adam. Nope. Can you hear me? The connection was there. Oh, you're back. You're great. Okay, so hold on. I'm just trying to get my um, fitting with my mic. I don't want to be wearing the headset, so I understand. Um, let's have a look here. Let's try this one. Okay. Uh, I talk like this? No? No sound? Yeah, I can hear you. You can. Okay. I just don't get any. Uh, I don't get any audio. This is awesome. Um, it doesn't give me an option for microphone. Um, okay. It's not. It's not the end of the world. If uh, I'll tell you what, we can hear you. That's really not ideal. Oh, hold on. Okay, you can hear me now. Yep. No? Yep, we can hear you fine. Uh, this is not <laughs> ideal. <laughs> Really? Okay, it's not giving me much. It's not giving me much choices here. Give me a second here, which is uh, so you should be able to hear me now. Um, okay, is that good? That sounds fine. Okay, good. There we go. No. Yes. All right. So, all right, you must be able to hear me now. So, okay. Um, I can hear you too. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. Okay. So now if I want to um, share my screen, and I understand there are a whole lot of issues with this, but uh, if I want to do that, there we go. I'm going to request a share. Uh, now that's share the event. Let's not share my screen. Here is share my screen. And I want to go to screen one, which is good. And I'm going to move you off to the side uh, so that I can share my screen. Cool. So uh, you should be able to see a slide deck uh, in front. Let's just go with this. Um, can you confirm that you can see that, guys? Okay. Cool. That's all okay. great, Adam. Yeah, we've got full screen presentation. Uh, we can cool. hear and see. It's, it's hot today. So um, I wanted to, and I thought uh, for those of you who are, I can hear you, by the way, Simon, so you can always just talk if you want. Um, okay. For those of you, so by coincidence, yeah, we were going to overlap a little bit on topic, and so I, I, I've changed my um, my topic up. But I thought you might, for the listeners, you might be interested to see. And it's not a it's not a flex at all. I just thought you might be interested to see um, a sample kind of trading journal, so sort of what it looks like from my perspective. So I'm very quickly going to show you this. Um, so, for example, this is my uh, trading journal as well. Uh, and so what I did was, so basically what I've got is I'll, I'll go by week because there'll be some weeks. So for me, I'm trying to keep it kind of optimized where there's not too much, uh, necessarily too much data. Um, and so I, I like to use Excel um, because for me, I can input numbers and I can have presets so that it'll automatically output the values and so on and so forth. Uh, obviously, Excel is such an amazing uh, kind of piece of uh, software. And then what I'll do, if anyone is interested, is I'll screen grab the setup um, before I take the trade, um, if I if it needs if it needs updating before I take, in other words, the kind of um, maybe it doesn't trigger the setup, doesn't trigger. There's another setup or something else is important. I'll take that. Then usually I will snapshot uh, snapshot the higher time frames. Okay, because what 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 should happen is I should be able to share that with someone else and they can uh, get it. They'll understand at least visually 
why uh, I took the trade. And this is really important because what we're doing, and again, I, I was listening to Steve's stuff half and half. I had other stuff to do. Um, so if I'm repeating anything you said, uh, then just take that as confirmation that that's the way we do it. So, you know, in my view, we're, our brains are pattern recognition machines, and therefore I'm collecting a library of patterns. Um, and so this is kind of also confirming the higher time frame trades, and then I'll record the outcome, whether it's a winning trade or a losing trade, because uh, the most important thing for me to do is to distinguish between whether that was a mistake that I made that I could that I can avoid next time, uh, or whether it was just a statistical market loss, which we're allowed to have. Okay, so I need to distinguish the two, uh, and that's obviously really important. So, and so I'll often do that. Uh, then, if anyone else is interested, I'll color code it. So it's color coded because it's color coded because the trade could still be open. So in other words, was it a winning trade? Was it a losing trade? Is it still open or was it a missed trade? So sometimes I'll actually I'll record a trade um, that was a missed trade setup. That and again, that's just contributing to the pattern recognition. Um, there was an obvious trade setup, or even something where I was kind of like, "Listen, I'm not sure about that setup. Looks good, but for whatever reason, I'm going to pass on it." And then it turns out it actually really was a good trade, and I missed it. Um, I'll have a record of that as well. So the whole point is, all I'm really doing is just feeding my brain with with price action so that it can improve, and it has a very um, a drastic impact on that. Um, and then I'll, I'll split it into categories, asset classes. And the reason I do that is obviously so that I can determine for the week or for the month, which ones were in principle, which ones I traded the most and which ones were providing me with the, the greatest returns. Um, and so I really like to take all those numbers out and then they, they get fed into um, a front page where then I can kind of track that performance over time. Okay, so the goal is obviously to be able to track that performance over time. Um, and in here, for example, the details that I must have. So this is not necessarily where I'm writing down what is my checklist uh, or any thoughts I have potentially. For me, the whole point about this is it's kind of imagine you're trying to lose weight or you're trying to eat better. If it takes you, you know, three hours to prepare a meal that you can eat, or let's be Let's be more realistic. If it takes you an hour and a half to prepare a meal that takes you 10 minutes to eat, that's unsustainable. Um, so the same thing with our journal. It should be minutes that it takes me to fill it in to keep it sustainable. And so uh, obviously the time frame was a trigger, did it trigger, what was my entry, stop loss, uh, what was the tech profit, um, uh, did it, for example, was my one-to-one -one hit. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you now about why that matters uh, and what was the outcome out of that. Um, and then any comments. So if there was something that niggled me a bit, I'll just write that down um, and then kind of do that. So for example, here, monthly ranging. Uh, so if that monthly chart is ranging, that's maybe a reason I should avoid taking the trade. Anyway, so I thought you might like to kind of see uh, how that goes. Um, and this is kind of how I'll do that and color code it. So that being said, let me get to the slide deck and then I'll come back to that um, uh, at, uh, I'll come back to it in a moment. So. Uh, <clears throat> the goal here really is to talk about making trading practical uh, as a as a you know kind of real world stuff and not always talking about trade signals and um you know obsessing about what's going on on twitter and what you know what's happening in reddit and 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 filling our heads with a kind of a bias with all the kind of stuff that's out there which can really get into our brains which is not ideal um so a little bit about me i'm going to tell you about myself in a moment but yeah i'm based in the city of london now and uh, and i say now i got i went out to south africa in march uh, to see a family member and then south africa was red listed and i got stuck out there for two and a half months uh, almost three months and i had to come back via had to do 11 days in Cairo and come back via Munich. It was just absolutely insane. Uh, and I was only supposed to be out there for uh, two weeks. So uh, the other thing is I've written a description here for what a trading strategy is. Okay, so it's very important that conceptually, if we can, <laughs> I don't know if you've had this experience, but if you kind of, um, this is why we tend to find traders that speak to us, meaning there's a certain author, could be Steve Nissen on, or Al Brooks, or it could be um, uh, Mark Douglas, uh, where the way that they say something helps a penny drop for us. Uh, and this is important. This is part of the reason we should probably get as much exposure to different traders as possible. Excuse me. Um, so that by looking at it kind of from different angles, eventually we can, a concept will make sense to us. And this is uh, something that I also try to do. So I've rewritten the definition of a trading strategy um, as to kind of how I perceive it. So a trading strategy is really is a written description, basically a written checklist that describes a visual pattern that occurs in the market. Okay, and this pattern should occur on a frequent basis. If we are not talking about gambling here, we're not looking for these ridiculous trades that occur once in a blue moon, 
that are like crazy stuff. This is about how we go about earning a living from trading and therefore these patterns need to occur on a frequent basis, ideally across multiple markets if we can. And that if we then trade those faithfully, in other words, we don't become the problem in the process. We don't interfere with the process. We don't move our stop loss. Um, I don't know, we don't take a punt. We're basically, we aren't a problem at all in that process. Then of course, it is much more likely to unfold in our favor than not. And then it really becomes about probabilities and statistics. So it's basically a pattern. We find the pattern. Is it a strong version of that pattern? In other words, is it a bullish breakout pattern or a bearish breakout pattern? Um, and is it, you know, because they can, sometimes they're really like they're strong setups and sometimes they're weaker setups. And so once we've got that, then uh, it's just probabilities playing out and trade management. So who am I? Uh, I am uh yes so my name is adam harris this is my second career so i'm now just 46. uh i used to own um a production company we had offices in zurich and in johannesburg uh and uh i i found myself i was the guy that if you if you ever watch these pixar movies um i was the guy that would do all the texturing and lighting that kind of make it look really pretty um and so when i watch those movies now i mean i i don't miss it uh, that much because i really burn the candle at both ends the midnight oil so to speak i uh i loved it but i <sighs> Yeah, it was kind of soul destroying in its own in its own way. That's a separate discussion for another time. And I was very good at it. Uh, so I ended up getting to a point where I just was very dissatisfied. It was I didn't really like kind of where I was living in Johannesburg at the moment. I wanted to travel, but every time I wasn't working, I wasn't earning an income. And then if I did have work coming in, which was paying well, I worked incredibly long hours. It wasn't unusual to work 20 hour days, uh, you know, several days a week and work weekends and you couldn't plan for holidays. Your life basically is, is, is tied to this. So it's an albatross around your neck. Anyway, so I sold my shares. Um, I became a qualified project management professional. I was able to look at my business as a business and go, this is not really for me. Uh, when I left, I decided, I sold my shares, decided to move abroad. Originally, I was going to move to Europe because I'd actually, this is going to sound funny, but I've been watching the Jason Bourne movies and I was like, man, that looks so cool. I really want to kind of go and go and go to Zurich and go to, you know, like travel and enjoy uh, Melfi Coast and do all those different things. I wanted a bit of adventure. That was basically it. Uh, and then I decided, did some research, decided I wanted to learn how to trade. And in my mind, it was the stock market. So this is 2008. Um, anyway, got to the UK, got to London in 2009 and started looking for some courses, programs to do. Uh, spent a lot of money on mixed quality content. While I was doing that, I somebody randomly mentioned Nick McDonald who uh, founded Trade with Precision. I followed his newsletter and then I paid more money and did that program. And then once I did that, everything fell into place. So... Uh, because I remember prior to that, it kind of I was, you know, I could make money, I could find good trades, but I'd also find bad trades, and it was hard for me to feel like I was actually progressing. And I kept going, well, you know, uh, you you kind of waiting for this moment where it'll just make sense. And it was really only when I started following trade with precision stuff. This is not a sell. This is just a story where he was purely technical. So no mention of fundamentals uh, aside from, you know, there's some big news coming out this week. I'm going to be careful of that. I won't trade those markets if there's uh, interest rates news coming out or Bank of Japan speaking or whatever. Um, but otherwise, all decisions to take trades were taken technically. And I've basically had to let go of trying of this bias I had in my head that Greece was going to default or I don't know that there was going to be a trade war and just kind of trade what the charts were telling me and then that took a while I mean that whole process of letting go uh, and just trusting the charts must have taken six months to a year to really fully do it and 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 then I've never looked back so once I did that all of a sudden the market became rational meaning all of a sudden the market's behavior because I'm only looking at the charts and if it looks bullish and then it it goes up, makes sense. So basically, and then also there's a big, big thing that he did, which was he only focuses on trending markets. So everything else is considered junk uh, and high risk to trade and trending markets are considered the safest, relatively speaking, to uh, to trade. And, and so all of a sudden the market starts to behave for the most part, kind of predictably, loosely within a range of options, it kind of fulfills some of those options. And therefore, and so for me, trading has become an evidence-based activity that is rational and logical. Um, and so that was a big, that was a major impact to me. Uh, then I was approached in the city I was working. I got a, a job as a prop trader in the city, which I enjoyed for about a year. And then I got offered, uh, I was uh, I was then given the opportunity to trade client funds, which I took. Um, and then I've kind of never really looked back since then. But it's interesting, for about three years, I did the 
trading lifestyle where I just traded and I hit the gym and then I went to the coffee shop and I was trading in the coffee shop and I was traveling. Um, I was in Spain quite a bit. I lived in Spain for a bit, which was fantastic, but it was incredibly lonely and I didn't have a partner at the time. And so now I am, I'm engaged to Leandra as Simon knows. And, uh, but I realized also I lacked purpose because, uh, the trading does not, was not a full time activity. And so I would sit in front of the charts for eight hours a day watching Netflix, like just, just it was ridiculous that in a way I was achieving the dream, but it was also kind of empty. It was a little bit uh, sort of vacuous. And so I realized I needed a structure and I needed a plan. Like, where am I going with all of this? And so uh, I, this is part of what I want to relay to you. So hopefully you, the stuff that I tell you um, has meaning. But yeah, you can get a sense of who my clients are, who I speak for. I do market analysis and speak for a lot of these clients. Simon and I do a lot of stuff for Finico Bank. Um, and uh, for example, anyway, there's a whole range of different things. So on the agenda for today, I want to talk about building an intraday routine, uh, kind of the things that the professional traders take for granted that you settle into. They're sort of almost beliefs. Uh, also things like what not to do. Um, market structure for intraday trading on all markets. So if you're not familiar with that, this is going to be a cool new thing for you that all I would suggest you do is just kind of chew on it for a bit to see if it starts to take shape for you. If it helps in any way, it'll make sense in a moment. Um, all right, so I'm just going to quickly take a sip of my drink. I don't mean to drink in your ear. Okay. So this is a big kind of, when I went to South Africa this year, and if you live in the UK, if you've lived here most of your life, it's very hard to believe that there are many, many, many places in the world where the average day is sunny and beautiful. Like where, you know, where you, when you open the curtains, there's like a 70, 80% chance it's going to be a beautiful day outside and the climate's perfect. Uh, it's hard to kind of understand that. So Spain is very similar to Cape Town, but like, anyway, the point is the weather is, is, is kind of fantastic uh, there. And there's lots of places around the world that have that. My point is, is that when I got there, I found myself going outside a lot more because first of all, it wasn't raining, it wasn't cold. And I found myself wearing like t-shirts and shorts and, and really just kind of from the, from the, the second I wake up, I'm much happier because, uh, and so what this did was this led to me kind of waking up early and I'm not really a morning person. Um, I, but I, what happened then was I just I decided to start this process of getting up way earlier. So I started setting my alarm for 6.30. Well, actually it was at 7, then 6.30, then 6 o'clock. Um, and now I kind of wake up at about 5.30 and I'm not a morning person. I've got to stress this. I really am not a morning person. But what I have subsequently kind of discovered over the last couple of years is that first of all, <clears throat> starting the day really early uh, when, when the rest of the world is, a, is quiet is a very kind of peaceful way to it's first of all you need me time this is really important that for our peace of mind to all of this by the way is about getting when we sit in front of the charts we are kind of in a relatively zen peaceful mode so waking up very early um even if it's, it doesn't make sense basically i found myself getting up early to uh go for a run i'm not a runner i'm more of a cyclist or swimmer have a swim, that's fine. Get in the ocean. Uh, my niece and I started swimming at this place called, um, at these tidal pools in Cape Town. And it was cold. I mean, like ice, ice cold, because the water comes from the Antarctic. So it's ice cold. And it doesn't sound fun, but there's, you know, this cold water gives you a boost. And so I'd get back to the desk and I'm like, whoa, I'm like already. And, uh, and I found myself, what was actually happening was I'm living my life as opposed to just kind of sitting here and it's sort of a slave to the machine. I was doing things. And so I decided when I go back to the UK, I'm going to kind of redo that. So now I'm up very early, take the dogs for a walk, go to the park. So I'm at the park at six o'clock in the morning, which you would never have caught me doing before. And I'm, and then I'm kind of back at the house where I'm doing a workout and at about kind of quarter past seven, I sit down and then I start. Um, now, this is really important, is not checking messages, not no other kind of uh, imposition on your time. This is now about kind of books, like we don't get the chance to read. So I might have a book on a skill that I want to develop. So that might be, uh, that might be, I don't know, let's say that you want to, um, learn about public speaking or you want to learn how to play chess or something else that you want to do. So now this is very important for traders to have non-trading interests. It is hugely important because the better our non-trading interests, the more balanced we are. 
We can't be a trader all the time. We can't do it. In, initially, we are excited about it. And initially, we, we consume videos and books and all kinds of things that we can. Um, but eventually, we get to a point where you, you will burn you will lose interest in it. You can't do it eight hours a day continually. It's exhausting. So you have to, and you have to have a reason as to why you're doing it and why you love it. And then basically not make yourself sick of it. You know, whenever I hear a song I like, it would be one of those things where I'll listen to the song until I don't like it anymore. I'll eat that food until I don't like it anymore. And that's something that you kind of don't really want to do with this. So first thing up in the morning to do something, to go for a walk or get out, but kind of go outside and breathe in the air and enjoy everything outside. That's a really good kind of centering thing. Um, and then me time, me time, meaning a book or a skill that you want to pick up or, uh, you know, if there's a anything, it could literally be if you want to watch your favorite TV show, but it's really meant to be, um, nobody should disturb you. And I would say that that's prior to 7.30 in the morning or 8.30. Historically, by the way, we used to work from nine to five, you can look it up. We used to work nine to five. Now it's become kind of more 838. Um, and certainly in our case, the markets are kind of kicking off at about 730 to 830. You can get a lot of your moves around that time. So, so being up at that time is a really good point, but it's also really good to have a clear line between activities that we do for ourselves that make us happy. And that, and then so that when we sit in front of the charts, we're like, okay, like, you know, I'm ready to go. So I guess what I want to, to sum up, I would say that I think it's a really good idea that we, uh, that you spend some time thinking about uh, things that you would do that are not trading related that are, because if you can do those, especially exercise, even if it's just a walk, even if it's not strictly speaking exercise, but something that gives your your brain can just kind of relax while your body does stuff is very good for in terms of endorphins and sleep. The end results is, by the way, is I sleep better. I sleep now the best I think I ever have since I was a teenager. Now I'll close my eyes at 10 and I don't wake up. And now I wake up at five and I'm like, and although I am a little bit tired, I my, my quality of sleep is amazing. So you can imagine that by the time I sit down, I'm very relaxed and I'm in a really, really good place. So then what happens is I'm, I'm the office I have is a garden office and not everyone has the luxury of that. But then I will start to look at the charts. Now I'm kind of going through the news from the previous day and it's all relaxed stuff. I don't want to get stressed out about stuff. And I start looking through the charts. Now I will have done a, a weekend market scan where the market is closed for the beginner traders. Uh, the last line of the trade uh, over here is support trade direction. If you're referring down to the bottom of the screen, it is my YouTube address. If you just look up Adam Harris City Trader, uh, London City Trader, whatever you'll find, um, the uh, you'll find it there. So um, on the weekend for the newer traders, it's an amazing idea to do to spend somewhere between one and three hours doing your market analysis, uh, putting in your support resistance levels on the monthly and weekly timeframes that will frame price action for you. It'll tell you, I color code mine. So you know how we've got on this slide, for example, we've got a red is often for the 50 moving average, blue for the 20, black for the 10, green for the 200. So I will use horizontal levels. I will color code them the same way. So green horizontal levels are monthly support resistance levels and then red ones are weekly. Okay, so if I just, for example, go ahead and just bring this up. So I'm just going to do this. Excuse me. So here, for example, this will be my, my daily, my weekly, monthly. And I will highlight those levels so that uh, I can I can determine as I approach them on my daily or, or even on my one hour time frame that, oh, this is a big level. This is a monthly level. So I don't you know, I have a, a sense of, of context and doing that on the weekend is amazing because your brain isn't being pulled by this FOMO of, well, maybe there's a trade somewhere. I should be scanning the markets. I should be trading. I should be looking for trades. So doing it on the weekend, you will see a distinct difference in your analysis in, and you'll be more objective because you're focused, you're living there in the moment. And, um, and so you'll be a lot happier with your analysis at that point as well. Then, uh, and then what actually happens is you'll find, holy cow, there's something that I'm looking at. So for example, if I look at uh, what was on my list, so let's just say the yen crosses. Okay. So if I look at them on a monthly basis, so CAD yen was on my watch list on the weekend because at this point price was up here and actually I, I wanted it to come down to, you can see it's in an uptrend and it often comes down to the moving averages. So there was a very high probability that it would correct to the downside on the monthly. And that meant that in the daily, it would be in a downtrend. So this is really what I was looking for was this trading opportunity kind of to the downside here. Um, and so this was this is where we made some Monday was an amazing day. And usually, also while I'm at it, another tip for the beginners: Mondays and Fridays generally are, are the kind of 
the weirdest days to trade. They honestly can, can uh, I would say more than 60% of the time they are, yeah, there's like Mondays can reverse Friday's moves and then Tuesday goes back on itself. So Mondays can have a lot of losing trades and Fridays, most people are checking out. So they can be a bit funny. Tuesdays, Wednesdays and Thursdays should provide really good opportunities. This week was an exception to that. Monday, right out the gates, the markets across the board were just insane. Everything on my check on my on my watch list was just moving like crazy. Um, so I think I did 3.6% or something on Monday alone. And then when the market has done a really, really big move, in a day, it will tend to the next couple of days. Generally, it will tend to kind of come back a bit. And so, basically, Tuesday and Wednesday were just like meh days. In fact, I was down yesterday. I was think I gave back a percent yesterday on 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 two trades collectively. So I'm I'm risking about half a percent to one percent per trade because I might have five trades open at the same time. And so, collectively, I have worked out where my comfort zone is. That my comfort zone is to have to not really have more than. A couple of percent in open trades. Um, like, I don't like. I would hate now, as I get older and I get more settled, to uh, be down five percent in open trades. That's insane. I'm very comfortable there. I could have two or three losing trades, and I'm only down like a percent. So, and then it's easier for me to recover because most of my trades are three or four R, which means I kind of three or four times my initial risk. So, even off a half a percent trade, I can come out at two percent if I have a really good move. Um, and, and so, therefore, and that's that's great. It means my losses are really small. I might just screen grab the statement from this so you can see this account live uh, in a moment. The point being that uh, that watch list that we created on the weekend would be a list of charts ideally that, for example, what would I stay away from? So if I had to look at a chart and go, okay, what would I not want to trade? So Euro Yen is a mess. It's just kind of, there's no clear trend over here. It's all over the place uh, at the moment. Um, whereas if I was looking at something like CAD Yen, for example, that did really have a really nice trend on it. And therefore that's going to sit on my watch list. Um, and so what that does is during the week, I have at least got a preference of about 50 charts of which about 12 were probably on my immediate watch list. Like gold is a bit funny, right? So what's up with gold at the moment? Uh, gold is stuck within this kind of larger range. It was in a nice uptrend, then it faltered, then it tried to go up again, then it got knocked back again. So there's something kind of going on here. And if you look at, uh, so if I go look at silver, for example, let's go through to that. Silver is, you know, even choppier in recent days than gold, it's even worse. Uh, and so you kind of want to make sure that you have uh, a plan for that. So doing it on the weekend, just to create that watch list is a great way. That means when the week starts, you can just go to your watch list and those will be the only charts that you'll be looking at for trading opportunities. Okay. What I also want to say here, so this, so your account would represent a trading idea that I've got. So I draw out because the market has a limited number of ways in which it can behave. It can trend up, trend down, or go sideways initially. And so I will potentially map out of the different things that I think it's going to do, which are most likely. Now, my watch list is made up of charts that are trending, and I'm looking for trades in the direction of that trend. That's my plan A. Um, if I have doubts about them, I might map out what price might end up doing, but generally I'll map that out. And then that's kind of what I'm looking for on those, uh, in those situations. I also want to show this, the sessions. So for us, you know, where these sessions overlap, I hope you can see my mouse pointer. Oh, the four hour. What was that? Sorry. Let's go back up. There was a comment about, oh, the four hour must support trade direction. Sorry about that. So the, the last line, I'm not sure why it's not showing up, but the four hour must support trade direction. Uh, so where these sessions overlap, that's really where you, on average, see um, an increase in movement. And you can kind of see here, it's from, you know, 7 a.m. to 9 to, to 11. Um, and so when I said to you that in the morning, kind of 7 o'clock, I'm sitting at my desk, I might be doing a, a workout. And the workouts, look, it's, this is not too, I'm trying to just give you an idea of what's going on here. Um, but, it, you know, just whatever I'm doing uh, in terms of exercises. And then in between the exercises, when I'm taking a break or having a drink of water, I'll be kind of looking at the charts to see if anything that was on my watch list is setting up because sometimes it's going to set up at, you know, quarter past seven when I was hoping it was sort of quarter past eight. So I'm, I'm looking at it at that point, but I'm not really actively sitting here and doing that. And it's rare, but on occasion, a trade will take off. So uh, the next thing is those overlap sessions are where you tend to get the biggest moves. And of course, when the US comes online, we'll tend to do that. Now, another thing, 
currency markets are not the same as commodities, equities, uh, cryptos. They're not the same kind of markets. They are mostly the same. But currency markets have two distinct parties. So, for example, with gold, you're trading supply and demand of gold. But with euro dollar, you're, you're trading the supply and demand of euro against the supply and demand of the dollar. There are multiple factors at play there. Um, and these days, because we don't have carry trade is not really a thing that happens anymore because the interest rates and all the banks around the world have come down to kind of stimulate the economy. What used to happen was the really big institutions would borrow money and, and kind of, they would kind of buy and sell and hold a position for months, which would create this longer term flow. If you look at dollar yen, you look at Euro, Swiss Euro yen, if you go back to kind of prior to 2013, you'd have these long month long trends, which you don't really get these days. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that that, that, those types of transactions are not in the market anymore. And so you might find that currencies don't really trend as much as they used to. So if you are finding you're only trading currencies and you're getting incredibly frustrated and you're getting ass kicked, tr consider the idea that you could look at stuff other than currencies, mix it up a bit because you'll find that that would explain at least that currencies do very short bursts. Sometimes they do long moves, but it's not as common today as it used to be. Okay. So what are the things that the pros to, what, are, what is it that you get used to as you get older uh, or, or kind of more settled in your way? Um, you always want to trade in line with a higher time frame. So what does that mean? It means if I'm trading the 15 minutes, I really want my 30 minute, one hour, two hour, four hour. I kind of want to be going in the same direction as that. And at some point in the much higher time frame, even better if I'm trading in the same direction as the daily. So if the daily is going down, I want to be trading, I want to be selling ideally. I want to stay away from messy markets. So messy markets would be, um, let's go through and just let me find the, let me go back. Let's have a look at cable. So if we go look at sterling, you know, sterling is, gets in, can get really crazy sometimes. So what I'll do here is I'll just make this a four hour time frame. I'm using pro real time if anyone cares about the platform, but this is really volatile um, kind of trading conditions. And so if the market looks like that, which right now it doesn't, right now it's heading up, doesn't look like that. But if it does, when I get on the chart, I'm just going to walk away because it's going to be like that for the rest of the day, probably. And it's going to kill me. It's going to take my money and spit me out. Okay. It's like a tumble dryer. So it's not going to work. Um, so stay away from those because that'll just take your money. Uh, you can reduce your risk. So in other words, my maximum is 1% on a trade. Um, and so to, to what kind of returns can we make? Well, out of, out of, you know, out of two to five trades per week, which is, it should be achievable on average, um, a net, profit of 1% should be uh, achievable as well. So because our strategies, keeping an eye on the time, because our strategies um, should have a greater than 50% chance of making money. That means that the more trades we make, we should make, uh, like we should start to go from losing to, to winning. I've explained that badly. Let me give you a different, a different way of putting it. Out of every 10 trades, if I have what's called a 60% win ratio, that means that on average, six out of 10 trades will make money four trades won't on average. That means that my first trade could be a losing trade. So now if you're a beginner, you're like, oh, my, it's a losing trade. It means this, does the strategy work? Am I a good trader? Am I doing things right? You have no clue because actually one trade doesn't have enough data to tell you that. You need to take minimum 10 trades to know how you're doing. So the, the idea is that yes, you, your first trade could lose money. The second trade could all, also lose money. I mean, it's possible you could get all your four losing trades up front, but that's kind of weird. Generally, you'll have, you, you know, what I'm saying is there's a 60% chance that you should make money on every single trade you take. Therefore, if as long as you're meeting the criteria of your strategy, the more trades you take, the more likely you are to actually make money. So um, the kind of returns that we can do, you know, if I have a really good day, I'm almost certainly up at about the two or three percent mark with smaller accounts for retail traders under, let's call it 10 million pounds. Because if you have a 10 million pound account, no, not many people do, obviously. You might have inherited a lot of money or something, sure. Um, I'm talking about anyone who has a 10,000 account, $10,000 account or 10,000 pound account, up to a 10 million pound account, um, are considered small fry predominantly. Actually, that's not really true. I mean, anyone over a million w would be considered a high net worth client. Um, but in theory, we shouldn't be risking large amounts of that. We'd probably be leveraged and we would probably be trading 1% of that on those accounts. So the actual amount that we need in terms of our orders getting filled in the markets is quite small. And so we're quite small when you, when compared to say uh, a, a hedge fund or a big institution, a fund in the city might be trying to get 100 million 
like they might be trying to buy into euro dollar for 100 million trying to get 100 million in orders filled they have a different problem to us they have problems that we can't even possibly relate to their problem are just getting their orders filled um without moving the market or without you know all kinds of other things so we have a benefit over the bigger institutions where our orders can get filled we, we have liquidity on our side um and so uh we want to just keep that in mind now um so what that means is that we can get we can actually make so even warren buffett will confirm this you can independently verify this buffett says that if he has a smaller if he had less money he could make greater returns because he's you know he's got to try and make profits on a on a you know on a hundred billion you know kind of deal or a, or a five billion deal it's much harder to make prof, big profits on those but on smaller amounts on 50 million you can you can do better returns so it's the same really for us but that's why is you know if we what kind of returns can we do well the s p depending on the last 10 20 or 30 years um will do depending on how you look at that time frame will do between seven and 14 percent so on the upside, 14% is kind of your average best return over the last 30 years from the S&P. Um, and so basically you could choose if that's what you, if you don't think you can beat that, then just put your money into an index fund and that's it. Uh, but I would expect you to be able to do 20 plus if you're an individual, if you're being relatively sensible, not doing 50 trades a day, but you know, maybe four or five trades a day, possibly maybe two trades a day. If you hit your target on your first trade, if you come out and you're 3% up on your first target, just that's it, done, get ready, get you know, if you have no other trading, non-trading hobbies or activities, you're screwed because now you're like, well, I've got nothing else to do. So I'm just going to sit in front of the computer and keep trading. And then you end up giving your money back because after a while you see ghosts in the shadows and you just start trading for the sake of trading. So, it's, so trust me on this, that having activities in your life that fulfill you that are not trading activities will will improve your trading results. Oh, uh, you know what that is? That's gold. That's sorry, I didn't realize it was gonna be that loud. Uh, what that is, is that is an alert that gold is starting to approach the highs and therefore I was gonna potentially take a trade if that is correct. Uh, let me just go and have a look at that. It should be, yep, there we go. So gold's to the upside, there we go. Uh, and I'm potentially looking on to take a trade on that. Okay, so I was just curious about that. I think that is it. Anyway, so going back to the slides, you need things that will enrich your life so that you don't waste it in front of the charts. Okay, all right, sorry about that. Um, so don't take trading losses personally, because remember what I said, one trade doesn't define you as a trader. You need a sample set. So you're gonna need 10, 20, 30, 40 trades at a time using the same risk approach, the same strategy to really be able to go, okay, the strategy works. I'm, or, or if I had this loss, that was my fault. So you don't take it personally. You really, really can't. You've got to learn not to do that. Um, and in fact, it's a good tip for life. Oh, sorry, this is, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry about this, bear with me, I apologize. There we go. And we'll just get rid of that one as well. All right, so sorry about that. Um, so, and it's a good tip for life, don't take, anything personally it's just not it's just don't do it okay so the trading decisions are yours and yours alone what does that mean it means that when you decide to take a trade your decision to take the trade should be based on evidence that you have compiled yourself so if you don't trust yourself now if you don't trust your judgment you must develop that develop a faith in your own critical thinking abilities to build a case to take a trade take your time but understand that that is a part of your journey. That is your future self. And learn to trust your own judgment. You might make mistakes, but believe it or not, the more you make decisions for yourself, the better you get at making decisions. Um, and also it's accountability. You need to be accountable to yourself. Uh, good trade management makes all the difference. I wanna show you something here as well. I've got an, I, I can see the time, so I wanna be careful of that. I wanna ch keep checking. I'm just checking the comments as we go. Okay. Okay. So next up, I had a, I want to show you this. So just to prove my point, let's say you take 10 trades, you're risking 1% per trade. And the 1% comes from a lot of research has gone into it from a lot of experience, risk of ruin. So that means uh, basically that we will have losing streaks. We will have them. We can't see where they come from. And once we start having a losing streak, we make it worse. We tend to get invested in it. We can spiral. Um, and the point is, is that if 
we can't tell when they're going to happen. So in professional poker, if you are putting a quarter or you know ten percent of your kitty into each hand, you could be you could have a great hand. You could keep having a great day, but somebody else is having a better day than you, and so you're losing. It's not that you're you have you're taking bad trades. It's just that the market's acting up. It's not that you're a bad poker player. You could be great. The other person is just getting better hands than you. It just it can happen. And so what happens is uh, you would then deplete your kitty because you're you're risking too much per hand, and you can't predict when this is going to change. And so that by the time you finally get back into a winning kind of streak, statistically your losses have kind of got out. Um, like work their way out of the system, by that time you've got no more money and you can't recover your account. So there's a mathematical, a lot of maths has gone into it. The whole idea is there's a threshold under 2%, around about actually 1%. Even if you have a long losing streak, you can recover your account really quickly. But once you go above, it's really sensitive. Once you go above like 2 3%, if you had that same losing streak, you might not be able to recover your account or it might take you so long that you just give up. So the, the science is in. 1% or less. Okay, that's it. So 1% or less for beginner traders, for your first 50 trades, 100 trades on a single strategy, do a quarter of a percent or half a percent. Um, don't go at 1% because when are you going to make most of your mistakes? At the beginning of your trading journey or career or at the end? So why have it cost you more than that? So in this case, let's just say that it's a 3 to 1. I'm going to make it 2.5 to 1. I'm going to be really conservative. Uh, and let's just say that I... Um, so I have two winning trades. I'm a beginner trader. I have two winning trades. I have eight losers because somehow I managed to get two trades right and the others I made all kinds of mistakes on. So I'm down 3%. Okay. Actually, if you've had bad losses, you'd be happy to just be 3% down. But in this situation, think about how you feel. You've had two wins and eight losses. You feel like you've been kicked in the nuts several times. You, your, your passion for this is, is dying quickly and you don't know if the strategy works because you don't really know what you did wrong and you don't know if the strategy works or not. So at this point, kind of what is your likelihood of, of trying it again? It kind of wanes. And so this is really problematic, but I want to show you something. So if I do this and just to say that I sit, I add in a rule of taking profit at one-to-one, -one, which I do by the way. Um, so I have three trades where I'm bank half a percent, not even 1% or one and a half percent per trade, but half a percent out of three trades. Um, and a couple of other trades um, uh, are break even. So suddenly look at the results. I'm up three and a half percent. I've only had two full wins at three to one. I haven't included four to ones or five to ones. So it's very conservative. I've had three losses. So the point of this is to show you that a professional trader in the city might not necessarily get more full wins, but they've certainly not lost as much and they've gained some, they've eked out some profit from their trades, which means that um, they, that's it. And that's trade management, ladies and gentlemen, trade management. Which brings me back to the other point, which is that the professionals know that trade management makes a big difference. So you reduce your losses and you have some that you don't make money, you don't lose money. But here's the difference. If that was something you experienced for your first, like literally that was your experience for three weeks in a row, I think you'd still psychologically be, okay, this is, I can do this. I can get this. And so I want you to understand that taking profit at one-to-one -one, uh, is, an, is an idea worth considering. Um, and I want you to kind of keep track of this. Okay. And then actually that if you did do this, you would kind of compound relatively well. Now, if you're interested, um, how much does it take to double your account every year? Does anyone know uh, what percentage uh, every month I could, if I could hit it, I would double my account in a year. Does anyone know that? Um, is everyone there? Are you guys there? <laughs> it's very quiet. Adam, I can hear you fine. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. It's uh, it's six percent. Okay. It's six percent will double your account every year. It's funny because you'd think we'd all know that, but we don't. Six percent a month will double your account in a year. So I was talking to you earlier about how I think you should be 20, how I think you should be twenty percent, um, and if you could do six percent a month. So basically, that means that if you could do somewhere between two percent a month and six percent a month, you're 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 just killing it. And that doesn't mean a lot more activity. It just means, I guess, smarter stuff and understanding that the big institutions cannot do the position sizes we can. They don't risk 1% on a single position. They don't do that. Um, and so we can. So can we, can, you know, can we do better returns for ourselves if we stick to our strategy and we have a decent strategy? Absolutely. That's just, that's it. Uh, and Anyway, so I want you to kind of, if, if I had to go back in time and give myself a figure, I'd be like, well, I think you can do somewhere between 30 and 60% on average. And I think if you have a really good year, you'll more than double your account if you can, if you could do that. And that would be looking across multiple markets, by the way, not just currencies. So I wanted to show you this. The next one that I wanted to, uh, the next thing that I was going to show you 
uh, is, so it was exactly that. That was a compounding calculator. Uh, and then also randomly, if you're interested, this is uh, a book that I'm busy writing that'll be out in August. Well, be finished in August and we'll see if it's ready. But I wanted you guys to have a look at it just so that you could see this uh, in the making, which is the absolute beginner's uh, guide to trading stocks as well. So I just thought you'd like to kind of uh, see, have a quick look at that. And I might I might do something with, with Simon closer to the time where uh, I let you guys, some of you get free access to it if you write me a review, whether it's good or bad, but you write me a review. Okay, so we might do that uh, at the time. You get a copy of it, but then you have to just at least give me a review. Okay, so tips of the pros take for granted, avoiding messy markets, reducing the risk, but not increasing it. Don't take the losses personally. Learn to learn to enjoy making the decision yours and building up the case to take it. Good trade management, as I've shown you, makes all the difference. Um, avoiding trades with less than two hours. So this is also Steve Niss, and this is a well-known thing, is try not to do a reversion to the mean strategies as cool as they seem. They just generally are inverted reward to risk and, and uh, not ideal. It's basically the, the best way, the least stressful way to for, for as an average day-to-day -day income earning approach is trading with the trend um, and most of the time your strategy should be more than 2% return on 1% risk. So 2 are greater than that. And so just as a rule, try to find a strategy that does that or more and you will find yourself ultimately uh, being happy. And position size is everything. The reason, what does that mean? It means that when you, even throughout history in all the books, all the people in the world who've ever, you know, had really, really bad uh, losses on their positions, almost always if they had just reduced their risk, that problem would not have been a problem. Okay, they still might have lost money, but they might not have gone bankrupt or lost everything they had or, you know, or just lost a huge amount of money. It really came down to just reducing that risk and that would have eliminated almost all of those situations. So just keep that in mind. Just think about that, that at the end of the day, you can eliminate almost all of the pains you'll ever have just by keeping a risk under a certain amount. Next. Um, so, look. I have to kind of clarify or expand on two of these things. So what I will not be doing as a trader, trading only one market, Euro, Dollar, DAX. Let me clarify that. There is something to be said for getting to know a couple of markets, getting to know them personality-wise. That is the case. I, I concede that uh, absolutely. So if you did decide I'm going to just focus on Euro, Dollar every day, that's fine. Uh, or the DAX, that's fine. But usually in those situations, even professionals will have three charts that they look at. They'll look at the DAX and the Euro and maybe um, the S&P. They won't just do one. They'll normally have two or three. For me, my focus is on trending markets. So that is that is what I'm looking for. And it doesn't matter where it is, that's what I'm looking for. Uh, and so that is my criteria. Um, trading to lower time frame, meaning if you, are in, uh, if you are taking your first driving lesson in a stick shift car, your very, very first, literally your first lesson in the car. There's no way you're going to get, you're still learning how to change the gears, check your blind spot, put your seatbelt in, use the indicator. And that's like, you know, that's like rubbing your belly and patting your head at the same time. You're not going to go drive onto the highway in that first session. And that's what happens if you start trading the lower timeframes under the misguided belief that the lower timeframes are the key to successful trading. And, you know, that's where the market's going. And that's what's going to tell you. It's not really the case at all. Higher timeframes for newer traders give you more time to do your analysis, are less stressful, are not as impacted by the news, day-to-day -day kind of blips and stuff on the news. And the news, by the way, is not the main market driver. Um, historically, the biggest mover of the currency markets were the interest rate differentials. Um, a news can either add a bit of momentum to it, but it is just one of the many factors in the markets. Uh, so trading to a lower time frame means that you can have multiple trends throughout the day or ranging, spiking, all kinds of crazy stuff. Your spread is a big factor in those situations and it's stressful. So it's something to work towards when you gain experience. More experienced traders can handle the lower time frames. I generally stay at about 15 minutes. It's rare that I'll go down to five minutes. One minute for trading the gaps so the US opens. Otherwise, it'll be generally a 15 minutes or 30 minutes for those trades. Chopping and changing strategies is ridiculous because then you sit looking at one chart for an hour trying to work out if there's possibly counter trend, range trend, what, like, what kind of, can I squeeze a trade out of this? If it isn't clear which way the market's going, you're on the wrong chart. Let me repeat that. If it isn't clear to you when you look at the chart, which way it's going, you're on the wrong chart. Allowing fundamental news and media to influence your thinking. You should just try it, man. It's very liberating. Just for one month, just shut out all the news. Just trade what you see on the chart. Uh, you can see if there's what time news is coming out. But 
high impact news, for example, or whatever, medium impact news, but then that's it. Then you just trade what you see off the charts. How are we doing for time? We've got 12 minutes. Okay. But it's very liberating. Um, and I often, uh, you know, hear traders saying there's no way that could be purely technical. There's no way I cannot be purely technical. Now I've tried every which way and my trading has never been as good as it's been when it's other than when it's purely technical. Subscribing to too much content. Now, when I talk about this stuff, I'm not judging. I'm going like, this is the stuff I used to do. And it, these are the lessons I've learned. And if, if it means something to you and it can help you, then great. Um, yeah, subscribing to so much content, to forums, to signals, and you're getting conflicting signals and, and that kind of stuff just leads to analysis paralysis, as does having too much stuff on your chart. I've got to show you this. So I saved this literally um, yesterday. Where was it? Uh... I, literally yesterday it was actually funny because I saw this and I was like, now I got to show you this. Where is it? Where is it? Let me just look over here. Um, it was a chart that a professional put up and I was like, you can't, how can you, how can you, how can you actually check this out? This is insane, ladies and gentlemen. This is insane. I don't really kind of, there's everything here. I feel like they, they just needed to throw the kitchen sink in and then it would be complete. Um, I mean, this is just, there's too much going on here. This is going to cause analysis paralysis. Uh, you can't cleaner, simpler chart. Your goal as a, on your journey is less and less and less and less stuff on, on your chart until it's just clean, clean price action. That's where you want to go. And you can get there faster by starting by just cleaning your charts now. Okay. Your brain will start to do it. But imagine you're driving in your car. Okay, we're back to the car analogy, driving in your car and um, the market is the pedestrians and the traffic and the stop signs and then, you know, all these different things you have to be looking at on that. Um, and if you look down at your dashboard, that's your indicators, that's like your petrol gauge, your speedometer, that's your kind of MACD or your RSI or your volume indicator. Okay, that's when you look down. Now, you this, as far as I can, am concerned, is you can't see through your windscreen. There's like so much stuff on your windscreen. It's like mud on your windscreen or bird crap on your windscreen. You can't see anything. And so you're trying to determine what's going on. Um, and so it's incredibly dangerous. This stuff is just, this is insane. None of this stuff will conclusively improve uh, your trading results. In fact, demonstrably, you can improve if you take this stuff away. Point is, if you you don't need to look down at your speedometer or your petrol gauge to help you navigate where you're trying to go. But if I block out your windscreens and say to you, look, you've got to use your speedometer and your petrol gauge to drive now, you're screwed. So understand that what you see on the charts is the important information. And it starts with price and horizontal levels. If you take everything away, the two most important things on your chart are, are price action, um, which is the candlesticks uh, or OHLC bars, and um, horizontal support resistance levels. That's it. Because even fundamental traders and, and technical analysts, fundamental analysts and technical analysts agree on price. They'll be like, okay, I'm getting in at gold at 1850 and I'm getting out at 1950 or whatever. So price levels are where technical traders can see where fundamental traders are placing their positions and so on. So that, that's the most important information. Trading high impact news. If you're under the belief that traders love to trade, make a lot of money trading the news, not really. That's kind of not the go-to strategy in the city. Not that I know of. Okay. What you want is a trend that's minding its own business. This is trickling along, trickling along uh, and you don't want it to be disrupted by anything. Uh, those are where you kind of, you're not paying attention. You look at a chart, you go, I missed this. And it's just been running the whole day for no reason. Hovering over your trades are like eggs. You tend to kind of fuss over them. Not a good idea. Just learn to let go. Um, okay. So not identifying conditions, but choosing trades randomly. There's obviously areas we want to avoid not taking profit. So when I mentor people often, uh, they go from picking bad trades for various reasons, like we all do at that point, to suddenly now they're picking trades that tend to go more into profit, but then their accounts are still going backwards. And that's usually because now they, they want their new winning trades to pay them back for all the losing trades they had before. And you can't do that. All the money I make today, profits I make today are actually there to offset future losses, not to make up for past losses. You have to change that thinking, way of thinking. Um, but you've got to take profit. You just have to take profit. So know that you can go broke, not take your profit. Um, over trading. Over trading means more than five trades a day. I, I'm just going to say that more than five trades a day, every day, unless there's a very specific strategy which justifies it. Trading too low a time frame is too volatile and use the media to put a bias in your head. Bad idea. 
bad, bad, bad idea. And actually, I think you could distinguish the difference if you're following someone who's always talking about, well, this is the, you know, ECB did this and that's why there was a spike. And they're using this stuff as an excuse as to why the market is just crazy. That doesn't make sense. Technical traders don't do that. You, you have a high probability setup and it either plays out as a chit or it doesn't. And there's no excuses for it. Okay. Um, there isn't, you know, we're not victims in this. We're not, we're not Trump's Trumpers. Anyway, trading too large a position. Don't stress yourself out. Keep those numbers kind of quite low and everything and jumping between strategies. Try to just master one and work it out. So for example, I trade trending markets. So therefore I am looking for a trending strategy for trending markets that can, and it should be able to work in any markets. So it should be able to work on stocks, cryptos, anything like that. Okay. Um, then this was just something I wanted to show you. This is a sample of an actual document of which there are millions out there to show you the kind of crap that big people that get paid big salaries, ridiculous amounts of money use to justify their existence. Okay. They write this 80 page document that sounds really intelligent, but it's just, it's just crap. It's just lies. And this, you know, they'll talk about this kind of stuff here. So for example, they'll talk about how the institutions have this advantage over the individuals, which is not the case. When we're trading with a trend, we are piggybacking on the big money. We can see where it's going. We're piggybacking on top of it. They can't stop us because we're in their shadow. We're like those remora fish that are on the bottom of whales and sharks. But this guy actually wrote this stuff about um, they would have an advantage over less emotion, more objectivity, better research and preparation. <laughs> I, I don't really know what that means because, again, that supports the idea. This is a different – you must understand they have different positions because they have – large amounts of money and they need to hold positions for very long periods of time. So they have to have a reason for why they lose money. They've got to cover their ass. So there's always a lot of explanation as to if they, if it doesn't work out, why it didn't work out. Retail traders are at the mercy of larger operations, but that shouldn't be a surprise to anyone given the stats on retail success. That's a lie. That's a complete lie. There are plenty of incredibly successful retail traders. If you don't believe me, read uh, um, Jack Schrager's market, market wizards. Um, there are, that will kick that kick the performance results of the big institutions because of that. But I look at all this stuff here as well. Are you um, more analytically skillful than other investors you are competing with? You're not competing with anyone. Actually, the beauty of this is that you don't have to compete with anyone. You could trade with the big fish. Wherever that market is going, you can piggyback with it. So this belief that you are trading against other people is only true if you're counter trend trading, I guess. But if you're trend trading, it's not really the case. Um, and what was the other one here? It was something else. But anyway, the point is, it's just junk. It's don't buy into it. So let's talk about market structure quickly because we've got, I know, Simon, can you let me know how strict we are on the time thing? Because I've got four minutes left and I wanted to cover this. So, Yep, Adam, if, 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 we, could, if we could try and get it within the next three or four minutes, that would be great. Okay, okay. Sorry, we, no, we do, we've okay. got the live okay. streams all set up and things. So, okay. sorry about that. So, market structure, ladies and gentlemen, if this is one thing I wanted you to take away from this, it's market structure here, which is on the lower time frame. So, the 15 minute, the five minutes, you start to see these lows, the previous lows that happen in price here. And then the market will come up to test that. So, what, what I'm not doing now is I'm not actually referring necessarily to the much bigger picture support and resistance levels, although I usually have those in place. So, monthly and weekly. And then I use pivots for other stuff. But when you get down to the five minutes or 15 minutes, what I'm really doing today is just looking at today and yesterday's most recent highs and lows for potential entry points where the price will go down, come back up to test it. And the way I want you to see that is that it goes, does it respect that market structure? If it doesn't, you don't get in on the trade. But if it does and it produces a series of rejections, these can usually be incredibly great ways to get into a trade. So here, for example, there is actually a support resistance level. That's also market structure. Price came back. I, I've got multiple levels levels here showing you where your potential entry points could be in. So this is a goal of somewhere where you want to work towards. Some of the stuff will show up on my YouTube channel, um, but the goal is ultimately to work to point if you do want to be an intraday trader and you don't have to be, but if you want to be, there's different ways in which we can get in. So we have a limits order here, so price comes in and triggers us in, uh, or we wait for a candle to form so we can put our stop loss underneath it and our entry above it so that it becomes a swing low. And we go with it. There are different ways in which we can get in and get out. Those are things that you can then choose for yourself. But usually it's based off and market structures just really is talking about the highs and lows of 
recent price action and how the market responds to that. Ideally, in the direction of the higher time frame. So if it's a downtrend, we're looking for sales and we want to see our price react to that. Um, and this is the boss level of intraday trading uh, price action of that's where you go. So have a look at that um, and just start observing it. I would say watch, kind of put a five minute chart up with just price action, put in little lines where those previous highs and lows are on the euro dollar or on gold and watch how it starts to respond to that. You don't have to take a trade, but just start uh, watching it. And the wicks play a huge role in that. It's kind of, I'm wrapping up here, but the wicks play a big role in that because when you see wicks, that means that market is potentially responding to that level. Okay, it's a really good one. So for example, if I have wicks on the upside like this and I'm in a downtrend and I get a lot of those wicks there, that could then be a clue that this market is failing and therefore it's going to carry on going down. And, and so that's why I say the wicks are a really good thing to see that supports it in the direction of a trade. This I showed you, so we can skip that. That I showed you, we can skip that. And this is where I'm basically, I was going to say, find me on YouTube. If you um, become a subscriber, if you want, because that just helps the my the YouTube algorithm pushes my stuff up, which I, I want. Um, and if you can do a couple of things, if you get 10 other people to subscribe to my stuff, I will give you two 30 minutes um, mentoring sessions. Okay. So uh, I will, uh, I'm happy to do that and that'll be free of charge. Um, Simon, I am ready to stop sharing and uh, hand over to you. That's it from my side. I hope, ladies and gents, I hope that you found that instructive and useful. Um, I apologize if you didn't. But... Thank you, Adam. So. Yeah, sorry to to interrupt you, but, but uh, because I've got these live streams set up, we we still have to um, stay on on schedule and uh, our next speaker. But thank you so much. We packed a lot in there. Um, we have the YouTube channel is linked at the bottom of the screen at the moment, so I can see a few people already um, clicking there to to register. And that's cool. the best place to get all Adam's uh, content and things. Is uh, just follow his YouTube uh, channel. So great, thank you so much, Adam. Always good, uh, a pleasure as always. We'll keep in touch, we'll speak soon. And right. uh, I will take the presenter um, roll back from you. We've got uh, right. our next speaker, Sunil Mangwani, coming to join us. All right, thanks very much, Thanks, buddy. thanks for having me. All right, cheers, bye. Now, um, question from Rick on, Question from Rick on the the video. If you do get a position with the little webcam picture is obscuring the slide, what you can do is click a button at the top. It's a sort of a square symbol with the cor four corners, and it'll say to focus or unfocus. Uh, in particular, whether you want to focus on the webcam or the slide. If you unfocus it, you'll see the whole slide, and then you can focus back in for uh, the full slide view again. But it uh, only happens in the odd occasion where there's <clears throat> bullet points down in the corner of the slide. So I hope that uh, helps you okay. Okay, so we're going to move on. Uh, Sunil is uh, here, I believe, which is great. So we'll see you in the, the next session.